So my aim here today is to talk with you about Michael Tomasello's vision of human uniqueness and how that would fit with human religion. I'm imagining what he might do if you were going to write a book on a natural history of human religion, to go along with the natural history of thinking and a natural history of human ethics, uh, human morality. I, I wonder what that would look like and what pieces are in place and what pieces aren't in place. So that's where I'm going to take you this evening. Tomasello's account of human distinctiveness has taken us several steps closer to a deep and stable understanding of human nature, both phylogenetically, in terms of evolutionary species emergence, and ontogenetically, in terms of individual organism development. His conjectures about the ecological species niche within which human cognition and sociality co-evolved for heightened cooperation are credible, I think. But even if those speculative hypotheses about evolutionary niches are mistaken, his empirical work comparing human beings to other primate species gives us reason to be confident that our minds and our cultures are indeed locked in a process of mutual co-evolution that has produced an unprecedented degree of complexity in cooperative cultural construction and competition. Tomasello's theory has received its culminating statement today in Becoming Human. It's the book there on the right. This theory has the marks of what philosopher of science Imre Lakatos called a progressive research program. It has a hardcore central hypothesis about correlated cognition and sociality, powered by shared intentionality and shared agency, that moves human beings from new forms of collaborative activity to new forms of cultural organization. The hardcore is both articulated and protected by a belt of auxiliary hypotheses that flexibly relate the hardcore to a variety of domains of empirical testing. In relation to distinctively human cognition, these auxiliary hypotheses cover social cognition, communication, cultural learning, and cooperative thinking. In relation to distinctively human sociality, the auxiliary hypotheses cover collaboration, pro-sociality, social norms, and moral identity. In all eight domains, there's a wealth of evidence that supports those auxiliary hypotheses and gives life to the hard core of the research program. Now to be progressive, according to Lakatos, Tomasello's research program would also have to make sense of domains beyond those where it was first developed, predict novel facts, and avoid lapsing into face-saving manipulation of the central hypothesis in the face of contraindicating data. In what follows, I'll discuss a couple of domains within which Tomasello's grand theory should be useful in a way that indicates that it is indeed a progressive research program. He has touched on one of these, human morality, in a number of his writings, demonstrating the marks of progressiveness, I think. Another, human religion, he has said a lot less about, and I shall spend most of my time on that topic. This will involve engaging the rapidly expanding literature in the cognitive science of religion and indicating how Tomasello's research program is capable of fruitfully engaging in this domain. Just in passing, I mentioned that we, in my Centre for Mind and Culture, we track the religion research and we now know that research that uses scientific approaches is publishing as much every year as research using humanities approaches. It's just about a 50-50 split at this point, which is a massive change in the last couple of decades and something that we need to be paying close attention to as scholars of religion. All right, let's talk about morality. In a natural history of human morality from 2016, Tomasello builds on a natural history of human thinking from 2014, applying his two-step phylogenetic process to the evolution of morality, and in the process, relating his interpretation of morality to three competitor classes of theories, evolutionary ethics, moral psychology, and gene culture co-evolution. In step one, some 400,000 years ago, ecological conditions forced early humans into obligate collaborative foraging, 
making them strongly dependent on one another. In that niche, dyadic intentionality was highly adaptive and underwrote concern for the well-being of partners. This is a fundamental aspect of human morality, and we see it centralized in everything from Franz Duval's lauding of empathy to Jonathan Haidt's emphasis on the universality of care harm as a domain of moral intuition. Dyadic intentionality in a context where there was shared understanding about how to collaborate, so-called common ground, led in turn to an understanding of we alongside I and an external perspective from which both partners in a dyad were morally equivalent. This is the foundation of reciprocity and fairness, another critical moral foundation in Haidt's moral psychology and central to almost all reciprocity-based theories of the evolution of morality. In step two, some 100,000 years ago, dyadic intentionality generalized to collective intentionality and the common ground of dyadic collaboration generalized to the common ground of cultural understanding in larger and more complex collectives. Cultural group competition became more important at this stage and the we of the cultural group had to supersede in importance the I of the individual to a greater degree than ever if a group was to survive and thrive in an environment of intergroup conflict. Thus, other domains of moral intuition became critical, such as respect for hierarchical authority, maintenance of in-group identity against both free riders and out-group competitors, and even the leveraging of the human interest in purity to reinforce in-group identity by conceiving outsiders as akin to bodily infestations and disloyal in-group members as disgusting. Tomasello's account therefore suggests that certain moral instincts are phylogenetically older in the human species than others, specifically sympathetic concern for the well-being of others and concern for reciprocal fairness are born of dyadic intentionality and are much older phylogenetically speaking, whereas larger group dimensions of morality related to in-group loyalty, deference to authority and leveraging of purity are more recent more directly tied to intergroup competition. Presumably these phylogenetically more recent moral domains are more malleable, adapting as the common ground of cultural group identity changes depending on competitive setting. It is interesting to note that the testing of Haidt and Jesse Graham's moral foundations theory has demonstrated that some moral foundations are virtually universal, both across cultures and across individuals within a given culture harm, care, and fairness cheating, and that others are emphasized or de-emphasized depending on contextual factors and personal temperament, authority subversion, loyalty betrayal, and sanctity degradation. For example, while conservatives and liberals disagree on how much to emphasize authority subversion, loyalty betrayal, and sanctity degradation in moral judgments, as you'll see on the left of that diagram, they agree almost equally on the importance of the moral foundations of harm care and fairness cheating. This is precisely what Tomasello's moral theory predicts. Regardless of how one might assess moral foundations theory, it is important to know that Tomasello's theory is consistent with and supplies a plausible evolutionary backstory for some of the most cross-culturally data, compelling data adduced in support of moral foundations theory. Tomasello claims that his theory of morality is more general than all three classes of competing theories at the present time. Again, evolutionary ethics, moral psychology, and gene culture coevolution. The claim of greater generality is meant in the sense that Tomasello's theory of morality is both more theoretically fundamental and more capable of comfortably subsuming the data used to support those classes of theories. This power of theoretical subsumption is a sign of a progressive research program. Moreover, at least in the case of moral foundations theory related data just recounted, it is a claim with some degree of support. This suggests that it would make sense to dig more deeply into the capacity of Tomasello's theory of morality to subsume the insights and data triumphs 
of these three other theories of morality. Other aspects of moral theory prove more difficult to subsume. Our own Martin's philosophical theology and evolutionary anthropology prospects and limitations of Michael Tomasello's natural history of becoming human, his paper makes the case that Tomasello's theory of morality cannot explain the decisive character of moral norms. Now, of course, any philosopher or theologian will be sensitive to that issue. One senses that Brill might make the same argument in relation to any theory grounded in evolutionary anthropology. His aim appears to be to push beyond the meaning of objective that Tomasello usually employs when speaking of moral norms, namely as a reference to the socially constructed reality of a cultural group, and thus as a way to articulate what he calls the common ground of a culture. But where would Brill want to push? Is there anything more definitive in ethics than group-based moral consensus? Well, any theologian who thinks of ultimate reality as a perfectly good being would naturally assert that the moral opinions of such a deity are absolutely definitive of the good and everything else mere cultural constructions of it. Even an atheistic philosopher might embrace deontological ethics to argue that we can use something like the Kantian moral imperative to reason to true moral claims with considerable assurance, far more assurance than ought to be possible if Tomasello's account of moral norms is as far as we can go. Surely Brill is correct that Tomasello's moral theory does not directly support his perspective on morality, even as Brill allows that Tomasello's moral theory might be rendered consistent with the existence of a good beyond cultural interpretations and perspectives. Tomasello, in his more philosophical voice, might want to say, I believe he would say, that he's not interested in going there, and that there is, in fact, nothing more morally determinate or clear than the cultural perspectives that take shape as webs of interconnected moral norms, often enough in e uneasy tension with one another. At this point, we have a theological or philosophical debate on our hands, rather outside the customary turf of evolutionary anthropology and cross-cultural moral psychology. So I shall address the issue as a philosopher momentarily. I really doubt that there is the moral war for which Brill is holding out. What's most objective about morality isn't anything like clear and universal moral norms, but rather natural possibilities with morally laden structures and dynamics, often taking the form of if-then structures. For example, if I repeatedly lie to people, they will stop trusting me. If I'm kind to people in my tight-knit group, most of them will probably be kind to me in return, and so on. This dynamic structure of morally laden possibilities is certainly worthy of philosophical exploration, but it is a far smaller step beyond the moral theory that Tomasello has already offered than would be required to reach across the normative chasm to the definitive moral good, which is where Brühl urges us to go. One might even say that Tomasello's theory renders my philosophical interpretation of morality more probable than Brill's or Aristotle's or Kant's or Confucius's, etc. Martin is in very good company, without ever being capable of generating a knockdown argument in favour of one side and against the other. As usual, and as I have been at pains to point out in a number of my books, scientific interpretations of segments of natural reality constrain philosophical interpretation by shifting the relative plausibility of competing philosophical theories, but science rarely yields straightforward defeaters of philosophical ideas, and certainly not on the theme of morality. Tomasello's moral theory will never be fully compatible with any view that insists on the absolute decisiveness of moral norms for all times and places, as against views that treat moral norms as part of common ground for particular cultures. I take this to be a theoretical advantage, calling such absolutist philosophies and theologies into question and insisting on an empirical approach that limits claims about moral universals to where they can be demonstrated to exist within human cultures. 
This is further evidence of the progressiveness of his scientific research program rather than evidence of a weakness, or so I say. <clears throat> now, moving to religion, what might Tomasello's theory offer that could further strengthen its claim to be a progressive scientific research program? Humanities disciplines from history to philosophy to literature have been deeply involved in the study of religion for several centuries. The scientific study of religion has been engaged by a host of disciplines in the last century or so. Sociology, anthropology, and psychology came first, followed by medicine, evolutionary biology, cognitive psychology, neuroscience, and even the computational sciences, which is an aspect of things we look at very deeply in the Center for Mind and Culture. Like any other large scale theory of human nature, Tomasello should productively engage the range of insights and the scientific study of religion has generated. <clears throat> so if you did that, I imagine there could be a third book in the trio, something like the green one just there, A Natural History of Human Religion. One large family of views within the cognitive science of religion <clears throat> treats the key cognitive capacities most important for religion as acceptations, which is to say secondarily adaptive traits originally selected for their fitness in other contexts and for reasons unrelated to religion as such. For example, the capacity for simulating other minds is critical for effective cooperation, as Tomasello points out, but once mind reading is phylogenetically stabilized in our species, it unleashes a host of side effects, including detecting minds in natural processes, leading to beliefs in invisible supernatural agents. Some of these invisible beings may be thought to take a moral interest in human groups. Suitably defined invisible moral beings could strengthen social glue by enhancing costly signaling of group commitment, lowering rates of free riding, reducing costs of punishing norm violators, and creating trust and reciprocity among people who may not know one another personally. Thus, with religion in tow, a group could well outcompete groups without religion for want of social glue to catalyze stronger cooperation. A few theorists in cognitive science of religion argue that religion may have been directly selected. The strongest version of this argument is probably that religious belief and practices have positive health effects on children and people of childbearing age a point well established for contemporary cultures in the sprawling spirituality, medicine and health literature. But some also treat the cultural group selection argument just considered as a mechanism of direct selection, not just secondary selection. If religion does in fact produce superior group glue, enabling religion supported groups to outcompete other groups, it makes more sense as an argument about a secondary adaptive context than as a reason for the emergence of religion in the first place, I think. As with Tomasello's theory, minds have to possess relevant traits in a relatively simple way, something stabilized in his first step about 400,000 years ago, before they can be launched into complex forms of cultural group selection, something occurring in the second step about 100,000 years ago. And the traits needed to lay down the foundation for many aspects of religious cognition seem to be the same as the cognitive powers needed to found cooperation. Thus, Tomasello's theory neatly supports one of the major arcs of cognitive science of religion, or to put it more sharply, effortlessly subsumes one of the major theoretical planks of the platform of cognitive science of religion. As far as this issue goes, therefore, as soon as Tomasello turns to write The Natural History of Human Religion, the hard core of his scientific research program will need no adjustment, only the issuing of new auxiliary hypotheses to interpret a new body of experimental data generated within the cognitive science of religion. Religion is complex and infamously difficult to define, as Tomasello himself said yesterday evening. The belief in invisible supernatural agents who may be morally concerned with human behavior 
is but one of several typical markers, none completely universal, but all fairly pervasive. Another typical marker is the way religion expresses and sustains the most profound elements of cultural group identity. In Tomasello's terms, this means that religion enshrines and sanctifies common ground, a point made powerfully by early sociologist of religion, Emile Durkheim. Here again, Tomasello's theory can effortlessly support this long-standing insight about religion. Yet another marker of religion is the way religion makes sense of and actually benefits from spontaneously occurring or deliberately cultivated intense experiences. Here, intense experiences refers to existentially significant experiences with unusually broad and deep neural activation, connecting disparate aspects of life into encompassing states of mind and generating a sense of strongly meaningful connection between domains of experience that are usually independent. For example, the sight of one's own wrinkled face in a mirror might trigger an intense experience. It could conjure memories of a different looking face across decades, close relationships with people who relate to that face, loved ones now gone, the God's attitudes towards the life behind the face, the accident that left a faint scar, the final futility of striving against finitude, the satisfaction of simple acts of kindness in the face of decrepitude and death, the rippling emotions the face can express and the events that gave rise to them, the birth of one's children perhaps, the mesmerizing encounter with a person who remained unknown, the fury at a moment of injustice and so on. One might attend to such an experience, magnifying its intensity. It might arrest one's attention, dominating awareness completely. Or one might sense intensity brewing and block its rise, moving on with the day. Such experiences are highly varied, sometimes complex like this one and sometimes profoundly simple. They can be deliberately cultivated through prayer and meditation, or through synchronous ritual participation. They can also be triggered using spirit plants or more recently lab produced hallucinogens, brain stimulation and other brain based technologies of spiritual enhancement, which are discussed in the book Spirit Tech that you can see up there at the moment. The phenomenology of intense experiences draws our attention to the five dimensions of depth, horizon, scale, complexity and mystery. Depth manifests in feelings of intense fear or bliss, inviting surrender. Horizon manifests in feelings of fascination or fear, inviting engagement. Scale manifests in feelings of awe in the face of vastness or emptiness, inviting beholding. Complexity manifests in feelings of disorientation or wonder, inviting exploration. And mystery manifests in feelings of ignorance or incomprehension, inviting reverence. For millennia, people have described intense experiences as the most existentially meaningful, most gyroscopically stabilizing, most morally orienting, and most behaviorally transformative moments of their lives. They underwrite profound convictions about what it is worth the investment of precious life energy. They are the productive and creative heart of religious and spiritual experiences, but they persist whether or not organizations, relig organized religious organizations exist to regulate, interpret and benefit from their occurrence. <clears throat> so they matter, in other words. And if we're going to be thinking about religion, we have to think about them and where they came from. The cognitive capacity for intense experiences is an important human trait for several reasons. First, it underwrites the capacity for symbolic behavior where the meaning of one thing is expressed through another. This leads to artistic representation in which an animal might represent the meaning of a group identity or a knife in a grave might express hope for the onward journey of a loved one. Second, intense experiences are capable of disrupting habits of mind and helping people strive for new personal goals, maintaining a dynamically adjusted executive self. This is taken up in Patrick McNamara's work on 
the neuroscience of religious experience. This leads to rapid accommodation to new emerging contexts, as well as superior problem solving and competing in an era of cultural group selection. And third, the capacity for intense experiences supports the ability to make rapid and practical sense of enormous amounts of information. It is information processing dynamite. <clears throat> the adaptive benefits of symbolic behavior, a dynamically adjusting executive self, and the rapid translation of vast amounts of data into productive action plans are obvious. It is also likely that humans with the cognitive capacity for intense experiences are likely to be emotionally and intellectually more interesting as friends and partners, and thus their genes are likely to benefit from the dynamics of sexual selection and partner choice. Whether directly selected or proving secondarily adaptive in new ecological niches, the capacity for intense experiences became a critical marker of modern humans. <clears throat> the cognitive capacity for intense experiences probably runs back at least as far as Kabart and Burial of the Dead, which is around 50,000 years before the present, or about halfway back to Tomasello's second step, which is around 100,000 years ago. This timing lines up fairly well with anthropologists who believe something cognitively transformative happened among modern humans around 50,000 years ago. One meaning of the so-called great leap forward. It is conceivable that this capacity may be far older without leaving compelling traces in the archeological record, but the behavioral and cognitive implications of the capacity for intense experiences are such that we should see evidence of it in the archeological record. And thus about 50,000 years ago is probably when this capacity became widespread. Given its adaptive advantages, it is likely to have spread through the human population fairly quickly. The question I want to raise is whether Tomasello's theory is capable of making sense of the cognitive capacity for intense experiences, which is such an important aspect of religion and of human life in general. I will offer two reasons to think his theory would need to be adjusted to take account of it. The first reason has to do with timing. Whatever religion may have meant for modern human beings prior to Tomasello's second step, after about 50,000 years ago, the capacity for intense experiences became a vital aspect of human life contributing to the ubiquity of religion across cultures. The realities of meaning and value so central both to intense experiences and to religion are easy to overlook when we are considering organisms in need of prodigious perceptual and cognitive processing power to navigate complex environments in cooperative ways. But existential questions matter too, and questions about meaning and value are distinctively human traits. In short, we need a third step, 50,000 years ago, corresponding to the axiological revolution in which existential questions of meaning and value, of beauty and goodness, come to the forefront of the human animal. The second reason has to do with the neurological conditions for intense experiences. The origins of the capacity for intense experiences seem to lie in ordinary sense experience. Perceiving meaning and value in the environment rides on top of discerning how to navigate and manipulate that environment. Both are types of affordance. In many animal brains, the dopamine system leads the way in helping organisms detect salience in the environment, what James Gibson called affordances. He wrote, the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal, what it provides or furnishes, either for good or ill. It implies the complementarity of the animal and the environment, unquote. For human beings during the last 50,000 years, this has involved more than accurately interpreting where to move, what to eat, how to stay safe, and whom to produce with. It has critically involved what is good and beautiful and true, what is meaningful, and worthy of devotion and what is valuable and worthy of protection. 
The sensory dimensions of affordance theory apply to all animal species, with fascinating species differences based on sensory capabilities and ecological niches. For human beings, the axiological dimension of perception tells us a great deal about what is distinctively human. Tomasello focuses on the uniqueness of human cognition and sociality in respect of cooperation, and that is fine as far as it goes. But human distinctiveness has axiological value-laden dimensions not captured in the capacity for advanced forms of cooperation. No account of religion can afford to minimize the axiological sensitivity of human bodies, neither their phylogenetic emergence in the evolutionary process, nor their ontogenetic emergence in the growing child. Thus, to write a natural history of human religion, I contend that Tomasello would need to amend his theory in two ways. First, he would need to add a third stage of human development around 50,000 years ago to account for the emergence of axiological sensitivity, leveraging the human sensory system. Second, he would need to add the cognitive capacity for sensory awareness into his analysis of the conditions for what ultimately emerges as distinctively human. Presumably this would be step zero, well prior to step one 400,000 years ago. Because of the universality of sensory awareness in animal species, but in human beings, this cognitive capacity develops in such a way that the species became capable of launching into an axiological wonderland several tens of thousands of years ago. A transition no other known species has navigated. The result would be both a broadening and deepening of Tomasello's theory in just the right ways to allow it to take full and fair account of the varied phenomena of human religion. Now, let's consider a new niche, religion among the non-religious. I have framed intense experiences as rooted in human sensory abilities, which eventually leveraged for axiological awareness, making values shine out from the environment as luminous affordances discernible by human beings. There are important individual differences in the way that axiological awareness works. Think of the visual artist versus the sound engineer versus the existential philosopher. All are exercising prodigious skills in axiological awareness, exploiting affordances that others can't even sense, but they are doing so in very different ways. The core capacity for axiological awareness and the variations in sensitivity to axiological affordances indicate how fundamental such experiences are in human life. It follows that intense experiences are independent of religious traditions, organizations, practices, and beliefs. Such experiences are so deeply rooted in the human mind and body that the vanishing of religion would be unlikely to impact the frequency of their occurrence, their distribution over the population, or their significance for the people who have them, though it would certainly change the ways that people seek to cultivate them and their accumulating impact on social organization. Religious traditions take advantage of the human capacity for intense experiences, may require them as a power source, and certainly inspire people to seek out particular types of intense experiences. But intense experiences do not require religion in the same way. Thus, as far as religion is concerned, the cognitive capacity for intense experiences is similar in function to the cognitive capacity for advanced forms of cooperation. Religion rides both horses simultaneously, but both capacities being more fundamental than religion do not need religion to survive in some significant way. To better understand the cognitive powers needed for both cooperation, central to Tomasello's thinking, and axiological intensity, not covered to any great extent in Tomasello's theory, it would help to know how they would function in cultures without religion as a dominant factor. Such cultures have been exceedingly rare as this audience understands, some would argue completely non-existent. So it seems that we have little to go on, but secularization processes have given us contemporary cases of subcultures, more or less without any religion. 
and also more or less free from discernible religious influence. This is a boon for researchers interested in the scientific study of the human condition, including religion and non-religion. One insight from the scientific study of non-religion is particularly useful for my current purposes. A recent study of the spirituality profiles of people who speak English as a first language or a second language from numerous countries showed a stark contrast between the religious and the non-religious. The religious, of whom there were over a thousand, rated significantly higher than the non-religious, of whom there were over 200, on 17 of 21 distinct dimensions of spirituality. That being the case, the dimensions where there were no significant differences are potentially instructive. They are appreciating beauty. This is a dimension of spirituality defined by cultivating awareness of the complexity and harmonious order expressed in the natural world and in human cultural products, as well as a desire for the beauty encountered in spiritual experiences. Or this is a dimension of spirituality defined by a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear or wonder and often associated with realities whose immense scale overwhelms or realities that are existentially overwhelming. Kinesthetic. This is a dimension of spirituality defined by cultivation of focused bodily awareness or bodily movements that are practiced and mastered such that artful execution flows effortlessly and spontaneously. Truth seeking. This is a dimension of spirituality defined by quests for knowledge, understanding and personal authenticity, which is often understood to be an essential part of a larger quest for ultimate reality. Now, obviously from this picture here, you can see that removing religion from people's lives has a big impact reducing the interest in and importance of supernatural beings and the religious communities and practices organized around them. But at least these four dimensions of human spirituality just don't seem to vary much between the religious and the non-religious. And note, they are all related to axiological sensitivity. This finding not only supports the hypothesis that intense experiences grounded in an awareness of axiologically laden affordances is more fundamental than religion. It also suggests an important difference between the cognitive conditions for advanced cooperation versus the cognitive conditions for axiological intensity. On the one hand, religion has powerful social functions, enshrining and sanctifying the common ground of a cultural identity, inspiring people to cultivate socially desirable virtues and connecting people in ways that are vital in moments of personal or social crisis. All functions directly related to the strengthening of cooperation. The results of this study show that religion is performing none of these social functions for the non-religious, a growing number of people. This hints that the collapse of religious institutions and worldviews in secularizing settings may weaken the social fabric of cooperation and burden institutions of the state with latent expectations for supporting the cultivation of pro-social behavioral habits. Maybe secular state institutions can compensate for the loss of these social functions of religion, and maybe they can't. But surely it is important to notice the functions religion has been performing in regard to cooperation, that in some subcultures it is no longer doing so. On the other hand, Eliminate the supernatural worldviews and practices and institutions of religion and existentially potent axiological sensitivity remains strong. Axiological sensitivity doesn't depend as much on religion as advanced cooperation does. Put differently, axiological sensitivity mutates more easily between forms of social organization than advanced cooperation does. Any account of religion as an aspect of human distinctiveness, including one based on Tomasello's theory, must take account of this difference. And as it does so, it needs to handle the fact that the cognitive conditions for axiological sensitivity cannot be reduced to the cognitive conditions for advanced cooperation. 
human beings are distinctive in part because they are homo religiosus. For a long time, this has involved supernatural worldviews and religious coalitions that can leverage those worldviews in support of the advanced cooperation so evident among human beings. But the grip of supernatural worldviews may weaken as education and existential security, pluralism and freedom strengthen in modern societies in the West and elsewhere. In the newly constructed globalized cultural niche that results, what of homo religiosus? One part of the answer is that the spiritually fecund domain of axiological sensitivity remains strong in secularizing cultures. Homo religiosus lives on in a simpler form in such a niche, free of supernatural worldviews, dissociated from the social functions of religious organizations, but productive of axiological sensitivity and intense experiences that help us shape our lives in existentially meaningful ways. Supernatural religion may or may not disappear, but homo religiosus lives on regardless. Now, some concluding remarks. I have argued that Tomasello's theory of human distinctiveness with its emphasis on the cognitive and social conditions for advanced cooperation is a progressive research program. It is particularly well-placed to subsume insights from other theories related to human thinking and human morality. It is less well-placed to make sense of human religion. Some central arcs within the scientific study of religious beliefs and behaviors fit Tomasello's theory quite well, particularly central planks in the platform of the cognitive science of religion. Other arcs within the scientific study of religion call for revisions and enhancements in Tomasello's theory, particularly the human sensitivity to the axiological dimensions of natural affordances in our environment at least as distinctive within human nature as co cooperation is, human axiological sensitivity gives rise to intense experiences that are a generative and sustaining force for religion. And this capacity has cognitive requirements that cannot be reduced to the cognitive requirements for advanced cooperation. Thus, if it is to come to terms with religion and indeed with aesthetics, Tomasello's theory needs to be broadened in its hardcore hypothesis to recognize the role of sensory awareness and affordance detection. Subsequently, as this cognitive capacity gives rise to potent new forms of human life around 50,000 years ago, a third step is needed in the account of the phylogenetic emergence of human distinctiveness. If Tomasello ever does attempt to write a natural history of human religion, it might end up sharing a place on my bookshelf near David Hume's The Natural History of Religion. Hume's book was peculiar in its time because of its sensitivity to biological realities and its adoption of methodological naturalism, which is why it is sometimes asserted to be the origin of the modern science of religion. Though most working in the scientific study of religion these days no longer read it. They might benefit though, and I think Tomasello might as well, if he hasn't already, Hume's spectacular multi-level awareness of the complexity of explanations of human realities is not much different than Tomasello's if you make allowance for the two and a half centuries between authorial contexts. Hume is intensely aware of the importance of the axiological features of human life, including within religion. Tomasello reads philosophers and Hume may inspire him to incorporate the axiological dimensions of affordance theory into his model of human development. If he does that though, it won't be simple subsumption. He's going to have to tweak the theory. Thank you for your attention. So, um, <clears throat> Michael Tomasello has entitled two of his books as Natural Histories, um, and readers will probably be inclined, as, as I was and as obviously Wesley was too, to associate David Hume's use of the term, which gave it an historically new slant. While it used to denote the study of natural phenomena, such as minerals and fossils in their historical dimension, Hume introduced a new provocative meaning 
namely making man the primary subject of nat natural history by following a methodological approach that includes two steps. Firstly, the identification of human endeavors uh, exclusively as cultural phenomena, and secondly, their explanation with exclusive reference to empirical, respectively empirically provable conditions. Michael Tomasello follows the path laid out by Hume in his natural history of human thinking, as well as in his natural history of morality, two books whose subjects point to what Tomasello has revealed to be the pillars, the two pillars of humanity, the development of human cognition and the development of human sociality, both of course intertwined in manifold ways. According to Tomasello, these are the pillars of humanity because it's precisely the peculiar way human cognition and sociality work that defines the uniqueness of the human species. Needless to say, Tomasello goes far beyond Hume's possibilities by grounding his natural history in evolutionary anthropology. The core of his research program are the concepts of shared attention and shared respectively joint intentionality. This refers to a nucleus of reciprocity that unfolds dynamics which lead on the one hand from the gestural exchange of perspectives to complex symbolic communication. And on the other hand, from dyadic cooperation to universalized concepts of morality. Wesley fully acknowledges how Tomasello turns the concept of natural history into a research program. After all, he's a proponent of what he calls the modern secular interpretation of humanity. What he means by this is a mode of scientifically based self-orientation about the conditio humana that relies on the principal compatibility of the empirical sciences. And this interpretation includes the naturalized genealogy of evolutionary anthropology as a primary source of answering the question, where do we come from? He also seems to be in line with the idea of true cultural innovation that is implied in Tomasello's concept of a ratchet effect, according to which human culture is characteristic of accumulating modifications over time. Because Wesley explicitly says that the modern secular interpretation of humanity does not claim to include every worthwhile insight into human life. It only demands that consistency with it should be a goal of any more adventurous interpretation. He says that in one of his books, not in the talk today, but I think that fits in here. In other words, for Tomasello, as much as for Wildman, for Wesley, talking about human uniqueness is not just lip service. Both understand evolutionary anthropology as a way to explain the emergence of an unprecedented life sphere that cannot be fully grasped from a somewhat external functionalist perspective. As Elizabeth Anscombe once noted, it makes a difference whether you look at a church window from without or within the cathedral. This eventually brings me to the point I found most interesting in Wesley's talk. Let me paraphrase it in the following way. Tomasello focuses on two pillars of human uniqueness, cognition and sociality. And he seems to suggest that these are necessary and sufficient to explain human uniqueness. But according to Wesley, they aren't. If I understand him correctly, he adds religion to these pillars, not in terms of positive religion, however, but of religiosity as a particular trait that characterizes the homo religiosus, a particular receptivity of humans to matters of ultimate concern. Now, Tomasello could argue in line with cognitive science, as Wesley points out, that religion derives from the exaptative use of cognitive capacities that he can fully account for in his developmental theory, a particular repertoire of proximal psychological mechanisms allows for recursive cognition of mental states, which again is the prerequisite for acts of we intentionality. Once cooperative relations are stabilized and institutionalized, the newly developed 
simulation capacities are funneled into the ensoulment of the natural world and then rationalized to the various concepts of deities or other supernatural entities. Now I just claim to summarize uh, briefly uh, Tomasello's position here at this point. The adaptative function has been clearly pointed out by him in the transformational process from the life form of hunters and gatherers to the life form of settlers and with a growing population density of settlements, conflicts between individuals and groups become more critical and dramatic and therefore call for an increased authority of regulation procedures. In fact, for explicit rules of regulation. The reference to godly or demonic entities serves as serves the authorization of the social regulation system and thereby supports larger scale group cohesion. In this context, Tomasello affirmatively refers to Durkheim's sociology of religion, according to which the religious ritual encapsulates the centripetal force of group life, at the same time expressing and actualizing this force. Now, at this intersection, Wesley could have made his point, the point about religiosity as another pillar of human uniqueness, religiosity basically going back to, well, intense experiences. I'll come to that a little later. So he could have made his point about this third pillar of human uniqueness by referring to an important aspect of Durkheim's theory that Tomasello leaves unmentioned where he mentions Durkheim. The rituals Durkheim has been studying unfold their binding power through the evocation of mental states of what he has coined as collective effervescence. In other words, their effects are based on extraordinary experiences or in Wesley's words, on intense experiences, which he, Wesley defines as in his talk, existentially significant experiences with unusually broad and deep neural activation, connecting disparate aspects of life into encompassing states of mind and they're generating a sense of strongly meaningful connection between domains of experience that are usually, usually independent, intense experiences. Now, according to Wesley's concept, Durkheim's states of collective effervescence would be just one expression, I think, of intense experiences. To share them with others is essential for their evocation, whether in religious rituals or in rock concerts, but collectively, collectivity is not essential to intense experiences as such. Because such experiences we can, we also and especially find among the varieties of religious experiences that William James has famously uh, described experiences that human beings make in their solitude or in intimate relations with others. But in a way, Durkheim's concept of collective effervescence seems to me to be a good example for intense experiences because it illustrates that Wesley's intention is not to disapprove of Tomasello's pillars of human uniqueness, but to add another one. Clearly, there, would be, there wouldn't be any states of collective effervescence without the preceding cultural establishment of we intentionality. But again, there seems to be a surplus vis-a-vis -vis the various forms of we intentionality that cannot be merely derived from the core concept of shared attention, shared intentionality and joint intentionality and so forth, namely the evolutionary, evolutionarily unprecedented capacity of intense experience. To give an account for intense experiences in accordance with his avowal of the modern secular interpretation of humanity does not suggest leaving the domains of evolutionary anthropology, but to dig a little bit further, particularly for that phase in human history when the axiological revolution took place in which existential questions of meaning and value, beauty and goodness come to the forefront of the human animal. Human uniqueness, according to Wesley, has axiological dimensions that cannot be captured in the capacity for cooperation but are based on the axiological sensitivity of human bodies that resonate with the natural environment and its ecological niches. Okay, I took a deep breath and a long walk after reading Wesley's paper because I was ambivalent about what I thought I had understood about its intentions. 
at first, I was rather skeptical about what I took to be a sort of fundamentalism of intense experiences that reminded me a lot of Rudolf Otto. I asked myself, shouldn't we be able to derive these experiences from the fact that we are interpretation all the way down? And does not our interpretive self and world relation derive from our communica communicative entanglement with our fellow humans that Tomasello has so ingeniously reconstructed in his book on the origins of human communication? Terence Deacon and Tyrone Cashman have argued that humans' symbolic abilities gave rise to dualistic worldviews according to which objects, and I quote Deacon and Cashman at this point, to which objects and events of mundane experiences experience are like signs expressing meanings that concern a hidden and more fundamental level of existence. End of quote. Only the inferential use of symbols allows us to fundamentally differentiate between signifiers and signified. Only the inferential use of symbols allows us to make references which are not restricted to the indexical boundaries of the here and now. On the basis of full-fledged symbolic language, we may form a principally unlimited number of statements about reality and ponder the pros and cons. We may think the hypothetical and contrast, and contrast the real world with possible worlds. We may reflect on our state of being in light of alternatives. We become aware of the limits of the factual. The symbolic device feeds into man's religious orientations, which become embodied in feelings like hope and resignation, expectation and anxiety, sentimentality, melancholy, happiness and despair, human specific emotions as Deacon and Cashman point out. Finally, the sense for a hidden, as they formulate a hidden and more fundamental level of existence calls for beyonding the imminent as Kenneth Burke has coined it. In short, can't we conceptualize intense experiences in terms of our symbolic capacities that we have developed on the basis of shared intentionality and that we can also reconstruct with the instruments of Tomasello's evolutionary anthropology? Aren't intense experiences rather a function of our symbolic capacities than just underwriting the capacity of symbolic behavior as Wesley states in his talk? But again, Wesley could affirm all of this and still make a good point. If you flip through the indices of Tomasello's books, at least four of them, I've, I've done it, there's one term that you surely will not find, namely experience. Tomasello seems to be well equipped to reconstruct the development of the perspectives of first person plural, third person and second person, but what about first person singular? About experience or in German Erleben? in the strict sense. Why is it that we are creatures that will never know what it is like to be a bat? What is the cultural impact of the experiential dimension of our relation to the world and to others? Surely the ability to see the church window, not just from without, but from within, has strong potential for cultural transformation that has to be accounted for within a research program of evolutionary anthropology. Wesley alludes to its cultural potential by pointing out that intense experiences are capable of disrupting habits of mind and make room for new goals. Can we reconstruct the origins even of morality without considering the first person stance? Again, Wesley hesitates to connect axiological sensitivity for intense experiences to the development of religion. He seems not to doubt that religion was a booster for intense experiences, but he is clearly of the opinion that intense experiences will outlive positive religion after its presumed decline in the modern world. After all, it seems increasingly plausible to me that an account of human uniqueness has to consider that we are creatures of ultimate concerns and we should debate about whether to do so requires a third pillar of evolutionary anthropology that would not be erected 
on the emergence of shared intentionality alone. Thank you, Magnus, for those very thoughtful comments. I really appreciate the care you've displayed in engaging with this paper. Now, there's a lot of debate uh, among people who think about religious experience and its biological conditions, about how it fits with the symbol-wielding animal that we obviously have become and what the timing is. I see this implied in the fundamental question that you put to me. I think the main reason for understanding the capacity for intense experiences as distinct uh, is neurological. So let's get that out into the open first and then talk about the complex overlaps. The neurological capacity for intense experiences rides on the dopamine system, intensifies ordinary sense experience by making available to us as affordances the sorts of value that matter to us in terms of meaning and so on. This, we presume, is not something that happens with other animals, particularly, even though the environment sparkles with affordances for them as well. It's just that for us, the axiological dimension is present in those affordances. So that particular neurological capacity is very different than the capacity, neurologically speaking, for symbol wielding. There's different parts of the brain that are used. Phenomenologically, there are distinctions that mark out the difference also that have neurological correlates. Uh, the, that's why I went to spend a paragraph trying to lay out the phenomenology of intense experiences in part to mark it off from the phenomenology of symbol wielding and the complexities of reference and the co-evolution of vocal tract physiology with the uh, ability to um, refer to things that are not just indexically or, um, or iconically. Now, if that's correct, then we've got a reason to think that there's a distinct neurological process going on when we have intense experiences. And yet, it's obviously closely connected to symbolism. I think there's probably some type of some type of mutual leveraging of these two capacities. They interact in very important ways. Um, I, I said in, uh, in the paper, the lecture, that the capacity for intense experiences helps to underwrite symbol use. But I didn't mean that it's a necessary condition for any symbol use. I meant literally that it helps to underwrite symbol use by making it possible for very powerful meanings that might completely escape the capability of our, of our cognitive abilities to express them. And yet we can still refer to them maybe through art or through technical discourse communities who develop fancy words to describe things that would otherwise be impossible to speak of or, or through the skills of poetry and fiction writing and so on. So there's, there's a lot of back and forth between them. For me, uh, since, since I take uh, I take Peirce's semiotics very seriously and use it to interpret things that are far more fundamental than human beings. For example, I, I've even explored the idea of using semiotics in Peirce's sense to interpret causation. So a fundamental physical process in which one thing stands for another in a certain respect. Uh, I think you can actually get somewhere. This is something like doing with semiotics the equivalent of what Whitehead did with prehension in trying to understand causation. So I, I'm not trying to back away from semiotics one little bit, and I know it's important to a lot of people in this room here today. Um, uh, very, it's very important to me as well. I just see something different going on in the capacity for intense experiences for neurological and phenomenological reasons that is entangled with symbol wielding in absolutely fascinating ways that have not been studied yet as carefully as they need to. So yes, I, I would say that uh, we, we still need to articulate something in addition to the conditions that Tomasello talks about for advanced cooperation. I've tried to say what that is. I do think it's the third leg of the three-legged stool that he would need if he's going to articulate his natural history of human religion. <laughs>